important yoga tantra text called the sat chakra nirupana we don't have to remember the names which a retired judge of the calcutta supreme court something went flying from someone called sir john udroff a uh, english man who a britisher who was a judge of the calcutta supreme uh, high court at that time who physically actually made a perfect study of the different centers of energy and the channels of energy which are discussed in the yoga tantras and I wrote a book which is in english called the serpent power it's actually a translation and commentary of the sat chakra nirupana so if you want to go into the details it's available i think you can order it in amazon or somewhere and get it amazon is amazing you get everything in amazon and google is a new god you can find anything the big g so Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> I'm going to draw a rough picture. I'm not an artist, but for you to understand, because tomorrow when we practice, uh, we need to know what we are doing. Mm-hmm. Look like a wired man, you know, like mm. okay, lie detector test. Mm. So, uh, can you see from here? Huh. I thought he said, I need a binoculars to see. Mm. Okay, I'll, I'll turn it and show everybody. Let me see myself first. <laughs> so. roughly this is what it is so we have all of us have spinal cords right backbone what i said was we all have backbones right okay i'm glad so the backbone inside the backbone is the spinal cord in the central channel from which um the channel that comes from the top of the brain passes through 
and ends at the bottom of the spine. This is the straight line that I have drawn. It starts. So, the topmost part is called the Sahasrara, the thousand petaled lotus, Padma. And the stalk of the lotus, stalk, S T A L K, goes straight down near the spine, inside, outside, in front, it doesn't matter. It's the same line as the spine, straight down to the bottom, at the end of the bone of this last bone of the spinal of the spine. So this is the straight channel which we call the Sushumna. Okay. Now on the left you see another channel here. It starts on the right, crosses here, inside, not outside, this area, and comes down and joins the bottom. And the other starts, the other place on the other side, crosses here and goes to the bottom. So there are two. So the one on the left is called the Ida. You don't have to remember the names, I'm, because tomorrow when we practice, we need to understand. So there is no need to memorize. The right is the Pingala and the left is the Ida. Now, for all intents and purposes, for everything that we do on this, in this world, Eating, drinking, sleeping, sex, driving, climbing, baiting, all activities. Uh, intellectual activities, right up to nuclear physics and so on. Music. For all the activities of the human system, it's only required either for the Ida and the Pingala to function. There is no need of the Shushumna the central channel. All the nerves come out from the central channel and form plexuses which form the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous systems which we all have and which take care of all these activities. We don't need, per se, we don't need this central system for ordinary functioning of our lives. According to yoga, some of the activities function better when the Ida functions stronger and some activities are better done when the Pingala functions strongly. Which means both are not equal, sometimes one is stronger than the other. Stronger from what? The life energy, which is called the Prana. The life energy moves through the Ida and the Pingala, sometimes more through the Ida, sometimes more through the Pingala and depending upon our actions, thoughts and actions in this life, it keeps alternating itself to this and that. In fact, in yogic science there is a way by which you can shift it from right to left and left to right because fortunately these energies are connected to our breath. The Ida is connected to our left side left nostril and the pingala is connected to the right nostril. So if you, you don't have to, I'm just giving you a theory. If you alternate between the two, you can decide which one works stronger and which one is weaker and if you want to increase, you can do it. There are yogic exercises by which it can be altered. Not so important for us, for this purpose. However, if our interest is in spiritual activities, to transcend the ordinary and to go beyond, then the Shushumna Nadi, the central Nadi, becomes important. So the function of yoga, yogic techniques, including Kriya, is to gather the energies 
that are flowing through the Ida and the Pingala, bring them down to the last center in the spine, which is called the Muladhara. Now, the left side, the Ida, is considered to be the negative and the Pingala, the right, is considered to be positive. Now, when I say positive and negative, It doesn't mean positive and negative in the sense that something is negative and something is positive. It's not that way. It is as if, uh, like if you have an electric charge in a battery, in a cell, you have an anode and you have a cathode, right? You have an anode and you have a cathode. You can't say the cathode is negative. Well, it is negative in charge, but it's not really negative. It's like saying male, female. Are females negative? Yeah. So, it's, it's anode and cathode. So, what happens when you rub two wires when one is anode and the other is a cathode, what happens? There's a spark, right. So, in Kriya, as well as very others, other Kriyas, not only this, one brings the energies from the anode and the cathode down to the Muladhara and there they are sparked together, hit together, and there is a spark. This spark is called the Bindu, B-I-N-D-U, Bindu, not Bindi, Bindu. Bindu simply means a dot, a spark. Now you realize that everything in this world that we see and what we don't see also comes from a small dot, from a Bindu, smallest part of the world, the beginning of everything it's a small spot which we call Bindu. It's from that Bindu that this whole thing explodes. And you can't see it because it is very close to nothing. But it is that from which everything comes. In the, there is, you know that there are these principal Upanishads which are the essence of the teachings of the Vedas. In one of them, one of the principal Upanishads, called the Chandogya, don't have to remember the name, Chandogya Upanishad, uh, a father of a young man who has gone to study with another teacher to find the truth, comes back. And the father wants to find out how far he has advanced which means the father also knows about it. He talks to him, he says, uh, have you found the truth? He says, I think I have. So the father says, if you have found the truth, you have found the truth. It's not, I think I have. Nobody thinks they have found it. You found it, you found it, or you don't. Okay, he said, let me look at it in a different way. There's a huge banyan tree standing there. You've seen a banyan tree? big roots coming down. He says, go there and pick up a seed of the banyan tree. He picks up a seed. Bring it to me. Okay. Now he says, remove the skin. What do you see? He says, I see the kernels, K-E-R-N-E-L, kernel, inside. Open it. What do you see? Well, I see tiny little seeds inside. Okay. He says, pull one seed out and open it. So what do you see? The son says, I see nothing. He says, it is from this nothing that this whole big banyan tree has come. 
in the same way, in this little bindu, it is almost nothing, tiny little dot. You also know that geometrically a straight line is a collection of dots. So when it goes back to the original, it's back to the dot. That dot is called the bindu. From the viewpoint of Tantra, as Bindu is the essence of creation, of the Mother Goddess, of uh, Raja Rajeshwari, Kali, whatever you want to call it. This little dot is the symbol of this whole energy that creates the world. It resides in that bindu. So, the yogi, what the yogi does with his kriya is to gather the energies that flow on the left and the right, Ida and Pingala, bring them to the Mula Dhara, which is the lowest center. It's called Mula Adhara, which means root foundation. Root foundation. It sparks them. And this little window, which is like a shining diamond, ready to jump, is then very slowly, using the techniques of pranayama and the sounds which are called bijaksharas, taken up through the sushumna, step by step, till it reaches the sasara. When the window has reached the sasara, your journey is complete. Now the path is straight and narrow, the straight and narrow path. And then it has seven centers through which the bindu passes. I have given only one center here, which is the muladhara, with a square and a triangle and a dot. And the last one, which some people say the first one, is the one with the lotus at the top. Between these two, there are five centers. One is in the level of the... I haven't put anything there. Did I? I have to get up again all this paraphernalia. So, anyway, it doesn't matter, it's okay. So, between the Muladhara and the Sahasrara, there are five centers. One is five fingers above the muladhara and below the navel, somewhere between the navel and the muladhara. Don't have to worry about the accuracy of it. It's called the swadhisthana. And the next one is where the uh, nabhi, uh, the navel is, which is called the manipura. And the next one is called the Anahat, which is in the center of the chest. Yeah. And then the Vishuddhi, which is in the neck behind. And the Ajna, which is here, but not actually here, but inside. When you look, it's here, but it's actually inside, in the middle of the brain. And then the Sasra. These are the seven centers. And they, all of them have sounds, all of them have colors, and they are also connected to music. I am talking about Indian classical music and the swaras. In Indian classical music, you start with sa, uh, not like this, but actually, I am just speaking. Sa, ri, ga, ma, pa, da, ni. The next is a repetition. Sa. Actually, it's not said this way. Sa, ri, ga, ma, pa, da, ni, sa, sa, ni, da, pa, ma, ga, di, sa, da. So, sa, the lowest sound is the muladhara. Sa, ri, ga, ma. You see that? So, in those days, the Samaveda, which is the origin of all Indian music, was done in such a way that one knew how to use which sound to awaken which center. 
so that when your centers, each one of these centers, as they unfold, the yogi enters wider and multi-dimensional worlds until when the bindu reaches the sahasrara, everything explodes. It's like a fountain of explosion. And then one understands one's true being. And also each center as it ascends, it ascends with a lot of happiness, a bliss, uh, and an intoxicating feeling. When you do this, when you actually feel the little bindu go through these centers, it's as if you had uh, three or four single malls at once. Mm. I don't know, I'm just saying. You might be knowing. So, This is the energy which was celebrated by many great teachers at the ecstasy of beauty. Shankara Acharya wrote a beautiful thing called the Saundari Lehri, which means the, the uh, beauty of intoxication, ecstasy. So every center has a little bit of ecstasy and then as it increases, one enters the world of ecstasy but also the world of knowledge and the world of expansion from the small to the big and bigger and infinite. So these are the Yoga Tantras. Now the practice of Kriya is to take this Bindu up the spine through the Sushumna to every center till your mind ascends to the highest. Uh, now I need to again explain something very interesting. Each center also, you need to know this, you don't have to by heart the words, but to each center from Muladhara to the Sahasrara also is connected with a symbol. And the symbol is the symbol of the different elements of the earth. Like, the lowest one is called the earth chakra, earth center, Muladhara, the root foundation. And the symbol is a square inside which there is a triangle. Now when it says square, it actually means a cube which is a symbol of the earth, the solid earth. That means when the energy, the prana, is functioning in the, on this physical earth, then it's at its grossest form. Gross. Not gross in a bad way. And then the next one, Swadhisthana, is represented by a crescent moon. Why crescent moon? It's the symbol of the water principle. This is solid. When solid becomes subtle, what happens? Melts. What does it become? Water. It will be the next stage of sublimation of the solid is liquid. And why the Crescent, because the moon, the crescent moon, is always connected with tides, with water. And also, if you pour water into a small test tube, you see that it has two levels. It's called the lower meniscus and the upper meniscus. Not straight. It's exactly like a crescent. And it's also connected with imagination. It is a watery principle which is the Swadhisthana, the second center, where the crescent moon is, which is connected with your imagination, and the moon is associated with imagination. And on a full moon night, if you go up and stand on the terrace, your imagination soars. And if that imagination, and what is moon called? Luna. And the imagination soars without control, then you're a lunatic. But here, we are trying to be a controlled lunatic. We are allowing the luna to work, but under our control, not half as that. 
you need imagination do you know einstein's famous words imagination is more important than intelligence and in the yogic process it's and in the tantras it is through visualization and imagination that you bring about change what you imagine becomes then a reality so that is the next level of energy solid liquid then what happens after that if the liquid is further heated combustion fire so therefore the manipura is the center of fire agni what is agni agni is the same is the root of the word igne from which comes the word ignition is a start up you know what is an ignition coil in a car igne agni so this is the symbol which is called the fire and it's represented by a triangle with its apex up and its base below stand up triangle fire red in color symbol of the flame that further heats the water principle and converts it into subtler form which is vapor wind air now this fire is been a universal symbol of combustion of movement of purification in the vedic age agni was worshiped as a major god you'll see this when you light a fire on a, a piece of paper stick anything even if you hold it down the flame always burns up so it's a perfect symbol of the spiritual from the physical always going up to the higher realms plus fire is such a beautiful symbol because one spark is enough to light a whole forest what about the californian fires somebody just sparked a cigarette and there the whole thing is gone one spark is enough to burn down everything so fire is also the fire of renunciation where everything can be burned down to ashes now we go of a god in india called shiva who covered with ashes all the time this is burned everything off free ashes are not bad they are divine now hmm what did i say right so also fire is a great symbol of desire we always say he was fired with enthusiasm he was fired with the desire to achieve the fire of desire the fire of creativity the fire which is also ambition is also fire it burns and then there is the fire that digest the digestive fire so all these are symbols and fire is a symbol of all this it's a symbol of the eternal desire it's also the symbol of our daily life desires you know what do you say if you meet an old girl friend of yours old flame or old water <laughs> flame desire <laughs> you know so agni is the symbol of that desire uh, this is the manipura there the mind is further made subtle till it reaches the next level which is the level of vayu air which is danahat is a symbol of anahat which is like two equilateral triangles put together incident it is like the israeli flag and it's this which is the symbol of anahat where now matter in connection with your mind has now been purified to the gaseous state about that is the 
symbol which is a oval shaped symbol it's called the vishuddhi it means that which makes it pure the vishuddhi center your mind has become ascended to a very subtle level and it is from that level that the cosmic energy and the energy in the human being join together this is the place where they mix together the vishuddhi it's also the center which is responsible if awakened in a proper way to keep your cells young and not allow them to degenerate so fast and then you have the ajna once you reach here then one is one the mind cannot come down or descend to lower levels it can operate from here but there is no danger of it slipping down and from here you have the sahasrara when the mind has become so subtle when the bindu has reached the sahasrara then the human being has now become divine so this is the ascent of the kundalini i'm not using i haven't used the word kundalini till now because it's a much misused and bandied about word in some magazines they say you can raise your kundalini for a thousand dollars so watch out mm -hmm. yeah, so actually it is this energy in the yoga tantras it's called the mother goddess red in color or black in color pretty dangerous because if you don't lead it properly you can end up in trouble which means inside you there is an atom bomb ticking away but a creative atom bomb not a destructive one and the bindu the little center is the main thing responsible for it now if this bindu has to ascend through the sushumna the central channel the central channel has to be open first unfortunately for most human beings the central channel called the sushumna is covered with so much muck that it is closed so the process of kriya to to start with to begin with is to have a technique by which the shushumna can be cleaned up of all the muck that is gathered muck in this life and muck that comes from the past from your subconscious these have to be first cleaned up so that the channel becomes clear and when the bindu starts its ascent there's nothing to block it there is no obstacle this is the first part of kriya how to clean the shushumna once the shushumna is clean actually you don't have to put too much effort the energy automatically dances up the spine you need to just invite you don't even have to push but for that the passage has to be cleaned up first and that is the kriya pranayam which you will learn tomorrow how to clean the passage first so that the energy starts ascending and your mind goes from the gross to the subtlest level possible in its subtlest level the mind disappears and what remains is the self the true self this is the whole process theory <laughs> um in some cases when somebody has a great deal of devotion for instance this process may happen by itself spontaneously without practice but for us in the yogic terminology in the yogic way of life there are ways and methods by which it can be opened up and the bindu taken step by step systematically in the other way there is no system as spontaneous which is why some people begin to behave as if they are crazy what happens when tremendous energy is unleashed and you don't know what to do 
here, that danger is not there because you take it step by step, little by little, from bottom to the top. When is the break? Uh, five. 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 So now in this part, what we have explained, after the break, I am going to give you the Guru Mantra, which is very necessary before we start the Kriya, and teach you how to practice it. Before that, what I have said just now, in this, first session in the evening. If you have any questions, better to clear and go because it's all on record, huh? watch out. Okay, since you asked the question, if you take Kriya, first, if you are going to do Kriya, if you are going to take up the practice of Kriya, remember that you should do at least once a day. At least. If you do twice a day, I am happy. But at least once a day, you need to practice. And preferably, the same time every day. Don't keep changing your... Today I will practice Kriya in the morning, tomorrow in the evening, day after tomorrow in the afternoon, no. If you say morning, fix morning and continue to do it in the morning. Or evening is also okay. However, the best time to do Kriya would be early in the morning, before the mind gets polluted by the earth. Early morning, on an empty stomach after you have gone to the toilet and bathroom and so on. If that requires a cup of tea, please have it. That's not a problem, because some people can't. Come back and sit down and practice. That's one part of your question. <clears throat> now, if you ask me, is there a specific time where you can practice Kriya any time? As I said, early morning would be best, but for Kriya there is no such special time. You can practice Kriya at any time. If you cannot do it at this particular time, you can practice it some other time. Only condition is, if you have had a full meal, leave two and a half hours before you practice. Which means if you had breakfast, don't practice immediately, wait till just before lunch time. Practice and then go have your lunch. Not while you... yeah. Now there is, there are these three sandhyas. Traditionally, one is morning, which is dawn. Then there is the midday when the trees start lengthening the shadows, and in the evening the dusk when twilight when the sun is setting. These three are considered to be very good timings for kriya. However, provided you follow this instruction about food. You can practice it any time. Okay. Midnight is a very good time to practice Kriya. If it doesn't interfere with your work the next day. Uh, every, I'm practicing Kriya in the, at midnight. So I'm irritated with my husband in the morning. No. Then don't practice. Unless you don't care about it. Uh, then... Is there a specific place to practice Kriya? Any place which is clean, which, is, which has good air circulation, is a good place to practice Kriya. In fact, uh, some yogis practice Kriya in the cremation grounds. Mm -hmm. Nice place to go, nobody will disturb you. 
if you have the guts. Mm. The thing is, the idea is, it should be, there should be fresh air coming in. Today, in India, for instance, I don't know about other places, there's so much pollution in the air, I hope if they change everything to electric soon, um, that it is dangerous early in the morning to sit on the terrace and practice pranaya or kriya. The air is very polluted. I suggest go inside, if you have an AC, put it on and practice. The air is filtered. But if you have a place which is open, a lot of trees, fresh air is the best place to practice. Okay. Uh, what should you sit on when you practice? You can sit on anything, provided it's clean, not too soft, and not so hard as to cause pain in your legs. Right. This is okay. Not too soft, not something in which you'll sink into. Something that can keep your body firm when you sit cross-legged. Now, step from that, the corollary to this is, is there a posture to sit for Kriya? Yes, cross leg posture is the best posture for the practice of Kriya. You can just sit like this, this is called Sukhasana. Or you can sit in Siddhasana. Traditionally, all Siddhas are supposed to have sat like this. Or you can sit in Swastikasana, trap your fingertips here and then sit there. Or you can sit in Vajrasana. You know what is Vajrasana? Legs down, up, the Egyptian pose. I hope everybody knows what. <coughs> or if you are a great expert in yoga, you can sit in Padmasana happily. But don't sit in Padmasana if it causes pain or discomfort and distracts your mind. It takes a lot of practice. If you start at the age of eight, then you can sit comfortably. These are the different postures in which you can sit. Suppose you have a bad knee. Sit in a chair. You can't bend your feet. It's okay. However, preferably cross leg posture. Then what did you ask? Should I eat garlic and onion? I don't think it makes much difference. To me. You can, but only thing is, if you take garlic and onion, don't go and speak to somebody too close. I mean, um, it's a problem for the other guy. Otherwise, it really doesn't matter. Don't eat too much spices anyway. It's not good for you. Keep it moderate. If possible, avoid too much sugar and too much salt. Not because of Kriya, but in general. Salt is the most dangerous thing then. And also sugar, too much sweet. So, roughly this is what it is. And one more, let me finish. Have an asan which you use only for your meditation. Hmm? Uh, it could be a folded blanket, or it could be a mat, it could be a rug, uh, it could be anything, but have something folded on which you can sit and practice. And when you do that, don't lend it to somebody else, don't give it to somebody else. Use it only for yourself. Okay? Not even your husband or your wife. Let them have their own, have your own, because after some time, between you and your asana, there is a relationship built up. Built up. You don't want to destroy that. Roll it up and keep it when you're not using it. Normally we, I, when I was practicing Kriya, used just a blanket folded into four. That's about it. Woolen blanket. I think that was comprehensive, I don't think any.
You know, if you if there's nothing you can do about it, it's better than not practicing anything at all. But when you get time, when you're not traveling, is there some time when you're not? Then put your attention and practice for longer periods of time, in whichever way possible. When you're traveling, of course, you do what you can. And you said your profession, you're traveling all the time. I have no profession, but I travel all the time. So what do I do? <laughs> mm. I practice too. Not that I require to practice Kriya at this stage, but I enjoy practicing Kriya. So I do it in some way. I sit in the plane, I close my eyes, and I do quietly. And nowadays many people seem to understand. I, I, you know, my co-passengers, oh, you're practicing yoga. I say, yeah, yeah, so. You know, and it's become popular now. Uh, and in a hotel room, Generally, you're alone or you have somebody else? Aha! <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. That's true. Then you have to warn her, look, I do some strange things, so don't worry about me. Hmm? Mm. Or do it later when she's up. Don't wake her up. Let her sleep. Uh, because they don't know. I had this terrible, uh, not terrible, very funny experience of uh, one of my friend's wife rang me up and said that uh, you know you have to come quickly here now, there's an emergency, something has happened to my husband, I said. The man was healthy yesterday, what's happened to him? I don't know, he's in the terrace, his tongue is out and he's panting like a dog. <laughs> oh, then I got it, I said, don't worry, he'll be fine. Then. I went, of course, and told him, please, you should warn your wife what you're doing. He was practicing Simhasan, you know. <laughs> but he didn't tell his wife. He thought nobody will find out because he was in the terrace, but she went up. There are such possibilities, but you need to look at how to handle this. Huh? Mm. <laughs> Imagine the wife going up to the terrace, the husband is standing. <laughs> So, hey, somebody at the back. <laughs> Good exercise, Jay. The spine, the physical problem of the spine is not what I meant. I'm talking about the psychic part of it, not the physical problem. Physical problem, you may even have half a spine and still have the Sushumna running. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's the inner impurities to be removed. It's not physical. So if you have a spinal problem, that doesn't mean that the spine is blocked. <laughs> well, in fact, in Kriya, even if it doesn't fall down, deliberately we push it down. Seriously. All who practice Kriya, who have been, they know that. We take the window up and we take the window down. So no need to fear it will fall. You have to take it down anyway. Huh. And then again you take it up and again you take it down and then later on you allow it to float. In that state, there is no danger of it falling down. Uh, if you still are afraid, you keep one hand down. When it <laughs> falls down, you can catch it and push it. <laughs> I'll tell you what. If I can't, unless you experience, I can't tell you. But if the window is going up, you will feel a sense of bliss and happiness going up. It's coming down, you'll feel the same thing coming down. That's how you feel it. 
You can't physically grasp it, because it's not a physical object. I'm joking, okay? <laughs> you know, I get such complaints. You know, one day somebody said, was taken Kriya from me, the window came up to here, and then, and then it went off. I said, no, what, <laughs> what am I to do? <laughs> You yeah, are still looking for the Guru. Maybe we see back the world, like you said, you say to the Bindu we can make it up and then down. Uh, is there a reason to, to, I mean, that's not the same effect, I suppose, making it up. And, and we could, so for, for which reason? But I'm making it down at which stage? Maybe you will explain it. When we explain the Kriya, you would get to know what it's about. It's basically, this is the pranayam where you are cleaning up the shushumna. So for cleaning any tube or any anything, you need to go up and down, right? Like uh, think of a, a, a baby's uh, milk bottle, how do you clean it? With a brush, what do you do? So here it's going up and it's going down, it's clearing up the path. And then, when it is cleaned up, then you are neither going up or going down. Somebody else is going up, or something else is going up, like that. Bindu not energy. Sir? Is it is energy? It is. It is. It is the concentrated, pinpointed energy, which is being directed up and down. Uh, it's like the laser diamond cutter. Hmm? May I say something? <laughs> when you practice Kriya in earnest and seriously, it's better to avoid altogether, but if you are still in a situation where you have to have a drink, don't practice your Kriya for at least four hours after that. But four hours after that you'll probably be down. <laughs> next day maybe, but preferably avoid because, so as I said earlier, we drink because we want to get intoxicated or free. I'm giving you a different drink where you can be free and be intoxicated. In fact, a great teacher said, now please can you get up from that bar and come here because I have a bigger one here for you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, Except that it won't be manufactured in Scotland. <laughs> we manufactured in the Himalayas. Huh? Yes. <laughs> Well, I have written, if I have written about colors in my book, then those colors must be my experience. And if somebody else has written about different colors, it must be their experience. And I think it can be different sometimes. Depending on what kind, you know, in the Sankhya, which describes creation, states of matter and so on, there is something called the tattvas. And among the uh, angunas, attributes. Now they've divided the attributes of all nature, including human beings, 
mind as well as the body into sattva guna rajo guna and tamo guna now sattva means goodness calmness tranquility rajo guna is activity uh, movement creativity and tamo guna is inertia laziness drowsiness and so on so all of us all our minds and bodies are made up of a mixture of these gunas in some some predominate in some something else predominates so depending on what guna predominates in a person there is a possibility of the color change i hope you trying to get what i am trying to say you and i may be practicing the combination the, the the proportion in which the gunas are in you may be different from they are in me therefore i might sometimes experience different colors than you thank you First, let's open them up, right? Yeah. Most of the thing we call Shakti Pad is fraud. So, if it is real, there is no danger. Unfortunately, now it's become a common word. Everybody says Shakti Path. I will awaken your Kunda. Now, if you have a weak mind, then it, hypnotically you might think something is happening to you. Nothing may be happening to you. If you can do it yourself, then you are under control. Nobody is doing anything to you. Again, having said that, I am not denying that there is Shakti. Path. There is, but it's very rare. It's not so common as you cannot, and it's spontaneous. You cannot say that now I will sit down and do Shakti Pad. This is not possible. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Now, the bindu, the movement of the bindu up and down is used in Kriya to clean up the Sushumna channel. Once the Sushumna channel is cleaned up, then the one you spoke as the Kundalini begins to ascend. It's not the same. It's not the same. Bindu is a concentration of energy which is made to clean up the Shushumna. Once the Shushumna is clean, what ascends in that path which has been cleared of all mark is the Kundalini. Yes, Kundalini is always See, a Kundalini is not something which is under our control like what when you breathe it happens, it's not like that. It's always there, coiled up, ready to go up. But our channels are closed. All you can do is to open the channels. When the channels are open, then it's on its own. Then whether you're breathing or you're not breathing, or it doesn't matter really. But what I have noticed is if there is really an ascent of the energy, then your breathing is generally very slow or even sometimes completely stopped. Not deliberately. Spontaneous. Deliberately you can't stop breathing because you might die. But when this happens, you have so, so much energy inside you that you don't need the breath. It's called Keval Kumbhak. There is no breathing in and there is no breathing out.
So, it's in your hands. Go to the next generation, even when they are young, and talk to them about it. Tell them you experiment for yourself, please find out. There are many more things on earth than you know of. So for that I have to be first ready for it, right? Then I can talk to the younger generation. So, you are right, it's better that they are introduced and at least exposed to such things so that they don't get to the stage where already there is so much stratified muck. Before that they can be kept clean. But first you have to do, right, before you go to Dada. We can't teach without knowing. So you need to expose them, at least to the possibility that there are other things beyond what you learn in school. That much we need to start working on. And I think it's important for the next generation in the future because then we will have good human beings, wise human beings, who will take charge of the way the world functions. Otherwise we are going to end up in deep trouble. Hmm? Of course, of course, there are simple practices which can be introduced for children even without their being involved in anything spiritual or any such thing. You can still start with uh, simple practices like um, watching the breath without trying to control it in any way. Um, hung so which is taking in the breath and releasing the breath, chanting hum and so. These are simple exercises and it's good to let them start doing yoga asanas. They're good for health, get good for the body, good for the mind. And very slowly you can start working. But don't force. This is very important. If you, look, if you are doing something and they find that it is wonderful and nice, why wouldn't they imitate you? You don't do anything and you try to force it down their throats. Why do they want to do it? Kriya that we give. Yeah. It's Babaji's Kriya. <laughs> but, um, from our understanding, from the tradition that we have, Sri Guru Babaji gave in the last century 108 Kriyas to Shyama Charan Lehri. He adapted it according to circumstances, according to the person and took out a couple of Kriyas and taught it. Now there are still many, many Kriyas. Humanity has not reached the, sta the standard where the average human being can go to all those Kriyas. So we have to stick to what can be practiced and then among a hundred or thousand people, somebody might be eligible for the next step. Because it's, uh, you have to be ready to do it, right? It's both, it's both. And uh, it, it is not always required, if you are not a systematic practitioner of Kriya Yoga, that it starts only here and then comes here. Spontaneously, maybe it works in a different center for you, in isolation. But when you take up the practice of Kriya, you would have then put it in its proper order, which is very good to do. 
because then it's systematic, it's not half that. Our hatreds, our allergies, our dislikes, our anger, and the subtle influences that we have gathered through many lives, they are actually stored in the Shishuna. Impressions. Impressions. In seed form. This is what I mean by it. And therefore, the basic necessity to get everything clear, to restore the circuit, if you put it that way, is to clean up this monk. The message is that you should consciously get to practice. <laughs> Till you see this actually and not only in a dream. And the dreams have a kind of significance for you. Because, because of your dreams, you actually end up physically seeing some teachers. The dreams are like a forewarning to you, not warning in the bad sense, saying, hey, Something is going to come up. After all, you should remember that inside, in the core of your being, as in the core of my being, the basic thing that sits is divinity. And it has different ways of working on people. Now it's working on you this way. Probably, why are you sitting here? If you go deep into meditation, you'll reach a stage where you can control this and get to the state in the dream, actually in non-dream state. That's what is required, because we have no control of the dream state, right? That's why you're complaining, actually. I have no control, it's happening. So I think we'll stop now. Have a short break, brush up your brains. And you come back and uh, in the evening now, I want you to take the Guru Mantra from me and practice it as I practice myself, uh, which is the first step. The first step is to link to the originator of this practice, who is Sri Guru Bhavaji. So how to do that? We will first go into that when we come back. And then we'll go to the next. Hmm? If you survive this, then we'll go.